Hi, and welcome back to another session on Coding Matters. And today we're gonna to be talking about a topic very close to my heart, hematology. Uh, and as a trainee in general medicine hematology, I was very interested to meet with the coders recently and talk about the common areas uh, where coding opportunities are missed out within hematology. And what we're looking at particularly here is not necessarily hematological admissions per se, but where hematology issues are either the principal diagnosis for admission under a, another team like general medicine gastroenterology, where anemia is a common reason for admission, um, or where uh, hematological diagnoses add complexity to other admissions, whether medical, surgical or other. So let's have a look. If this is your first time joining us with Coding Matters, just a reminder that the DRG, which is the admission uh, diagnosis group that they are, a patient is admitted under in hospital, uh, relies on a principal diagnosis that informs the DRG, and then complexity is added according to secondary diagnoses, complications and comorbidities. And that's what we're gonna focus on. So in particular, we're gonna look at cytopenias. So cytopenias is where there is a cell, uh, a blood cell line that is uh, deficient. Uh, and so there's a quantitative deficit uh, in one of those cell lines, either red cells, white cells, or platelets, which we call anemia, um, leukocytopenia, or, or neutropenia, if it's particularly neutrophils, just the more common one, or thrombocytopenia. Um, these can also be grouped if there is more than one cell line deficient as a bicytopenia, commonly things like anemia and thrombocytopenia together, or a pancytopenia, saying that all three cell lines uh, are affected. Pancytopenia is a, a significant cause for concern and usually cause for a haematology consult, um, if not haematology admission and bone marrow biopsy to be considered. Um, in terms of anemia, um, there's a lot of other causes. Anemia is a massive crossover with surgery and other areas of medicine. Uh, coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia issues is another thing we'll look at. Uh, and then white so cell abnormalities, how they can be coded. And finally finishing on uh, venous thromboembolism, in particular DVT and PE. So to qualify for a criteria, you need to have a diagnostic statement that incorporates that diagnosis um, that's quite literally in, in the documentation at some point during the notes, whether admission, during a ward round, during a consult note, or ideally in the discharge summary. Uh, there needs to be an intervention, whether it's just as simple as a blood test or a physical examination, or it's an invasive um, uh, investigation such as a coronary angiogram or uh, upper endoscopy uh, that confirms that diagnosis or at least adds more evidence to the diagnosis and then some kind of management plan whether it's further investigation or to fix the plan or to better understand it or stabilize it. So in terms of uh, cytopenias um, you need to be very specific pan cytopenia and bicytopenia do not code at all you need to be specific so if someone has a pan cytopenia um, and it doesn't have one major diagnosis, for example, someone admitted with acute uh, myeloid leukemia, that would be the diagnostic group rather than pancytopenia. But if they're being investigated for pancytopenia, or it's adding to the diagnosis, please do not use that term. Please use the term anemia, thrombocytopenia, or leukopenia, at least somewhere in the notes, um, so that that can be coded all as individual items that add complexity. Um, whenever any of these uh, are added and we're investigating, it's good to specify and it really helps the coders if you're actually going to say, rather than just we're just doing it on a daily blood test, if you're going to say, I've identified anemia with a haemoglobin of 79 on routine bloods and let's repeat the, the CBE later today to confirm that diagnosis or let's repeat the CBE over the next couple of days to see the trend of the anemia you're at least doing some kind of intervention or, or investigation to confirm that diagnosis rather than just a once-off test that wasn't done specifically to look for that. Uh, and then ideally, you're specifying the cause of the disorder. Um, commonly, iron deficiency anemia is such a great uh, condition because it's so easy to treat uh, in the inpatient and outpatient setting, but it could be B12 or folate. Um, it could be infection related or sepsis mediated. It could be bone marrow infiltration or a primary bone marrow disorder. Whatever it is, whatever you think it is, even if it's not completely certain, put in what is the likely or confirmed cause of either, any of those cytopenias. So let's have a look at how pancytopenia doesn't code properly. Here's an example of someone that's admitted for five days with investigation of pancytopenia. That's all that's ever documented. Two and a half thousand dollars worth of funding towards that admission. Um, as opposed to someone that is admitted with anemia, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia, that is gonna get major complexity at $7,000. It's a significant improvement um, of almost three times the amount of funding. That's a big deal. If you look at anemia in detail, which we've alluded to already, you can have secondary anemia, or in particular, the common one is secondary to blood loss, and clarifying whether that is acute or chronic. You know, if it's acute, you're gonna think more of a hemorrhage uh, type term that you might use, and ideally, you're then identifying where that blood loss is coming from, whether it's a GI tract or surgical or traumatic, um, whatever it is. Uh, 
and it can be post-operative. Post-operative is defined between having a hemorrhage within uh, the, the operating period as opposed to just general anemia due to s standard surgical with, uh, methods without uh, any major hemorrhage documented. Uh, there can be also nutritional deficiencies. There's obviously other conditions um, like malabsorption disorders that might contribute to making these standard nutritional deficiencies much worse. Uh, iron deficiency, B12 and folate being the common one. You can think of things that are linked to that like pernicious anemia, celiac disease, um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, in particular Crohn's disorder that contribute to the malabsorption type syndromes that make those uh, anemias much worse. And then I also think of um, EPO deficiency uh, from chronic kidney disease as a reasonably common uh, cause as well. So whatever it is, um, if you have a likelihood or if there's more than one factor, please write them down at some point. Here's anemia as an additional diagnosis rather than um, the, the primary or principal diagnosis. A patient here is admitted for four days with a diagnosis of a GI bleed and acute kidney injury with a haemoglobin of 99 and no specific plan around the anemia, just the focus on the bleed. Uh, that's gonna be minor complexity and that's going to be about $2,000 of funding. Compare that to someone with this, exactly the same issue, but they actually specified that a repeat CBE was ordered um, in order to establish the diagnosis of anemia due to blood loss. That suddenly adds complexity and you're getting uh, two and a half times the amount of funding there at $5,500. So that's a big difference. So in terms of um, other platelet disorders uh, and coagulation disorders generally, these are often grouped together with encoding. Um, you can think of hereditary factor deficiencies like uh, haemophilia A or B, and there's some other rarer ones like factor five or factor 10. Um, there can be uh, hemorrhagic disorders due to anticoagulants and naming the anticoagulant there. Um, obviously the anticoagulant doesn't cause bleeding itself, it just might make what was an insignificant bleed a significant bleed, or what was a significant bleed a life-threatening bleed. It makes whatever bleeding harder to control and more likely to affect the patient's uh, clinical status. Um, one of the ones that's often put is the coagulation defect unspecified. So if you're just going to write literally like coagulopathy, that's what you'll get. That still actually adds a lot of complexity and is probably underutilized. Uh, there can be other ones like uh, primary thrombocytopenia. Um, the more common causes of, of th uh, thrombocytopenia are secondary. I think of things like septic um, thrombocytopenia, ITP, which is immune or idiopathic um, thrombocytopapura, which is uh, uncommon but not, not hugely rare. Um, chemotherapy and other agents like methotrexate do actually add uh, to bone marrow suppression and will cause thrombocytopenia as well as anemia um, and neutropenia. Uh, and even levo cirrhosis is a pretty common cause of chronic um, thrombocytopenia of varying severity. Uh, so these are things you can consider. Please, if there's a secondary cause, uh, write it. Even if it's not yet confirmed, you can say this is likely. Here's an example of thrombocytopenia with a patient admitted for eight days with a diagnosis of sepsis due to acute cholecystitis and acute co kidney injury on the background of chronic kidney disease. Just with that one alone, that's uh, you know, pretty decent funding for someone who might have ended up in ICU, $5,500. Compare that to someone that's been admitted for the same issues and the, the only difference is the documentation, which is more specific and specifies that the thrombocytopenia is secondary to sepsis, that takes that whole admission into an intermediate complexity category and effectively doubles the funding uh, for that. So that's a very big difference. So that's something that we might be missing out on. Then in terms of coagulopathy, here's an example of someone that was admitted for 10 days with a diagnosis of liver cirrhosis, liver failure, and acute on chronic um, kidney disease. Uh, minor complexity will give you $4,800. If you were to specify that there is a coagulopathy related to the liver disease, and that's probably gonna manifest itself in a raised INR, uh, that's gonna have major com complexity that's more than doubling the income for that uh, admission. In terms of white cell counts um, and abnormalities in the numbers of cells, those themselves are coded as signs or symptoms, so they are not diagnoses in the cells. So things like uh, leukocytosis or neutrophilia or neutropenia alone do not code well. But the one that does code, and this is gonna be in effect for at least another uh, 18 months, is immunodeficiency or immunocompromised status that may be secondary to a deficiency, either qualitative or quantitative in their white cell count. Um, and neutropenia specifically with or without fever um, does actually code as well. That's one of the rare ones that does. Uh, otherwise it will come out with a, a disorder of white cells unspecified that doesn't really work very well. But immunocompromised status, immunodeficiency is something we're probably missing on our coding. So here's an example of how to apply that. We've got a patient admitted um, for pneumonia uh, as an exacerbation of COPD. 
they've got a background of rheumatoid arthritis and they're on methotrexate. And maybe if we just put that in, you'll get minor complexity of $4,000. If we were then to specify that the methotrexate that is being given for treatment of RA is immunosuppressing the patient or resulting in an immunocompromised status, um, which is contributing obviously to the complexity of that anemia, it literally contributes to the complexity of that, uh, of that pneumonia and will improve um, the complexity to a major, which is $8,000. That's almost doubling the income. That's a big change for a small uh, number of words that are added there. In terms of uh, VTE or venous thromboembolism, um, the, the big change in DVT that I'd love to see is that um, we are we're decent at getting provoked versus unprovoked. That should be standard as part of our documentation. But the one that I didn't know added complexity was specifying the veins. In particular, if there is more than one vein involved in a DVT, you will add complexity by that. And so specifying the veins involved, that will, will, will be a good thing for the coding. Um, likewise for PE, where the PE is doesn't actually make, you know, if it's saddle or it's subsegmental, honestly it's the same uh, kind of complexity on a coding level, even though that we know those uh, potentially are life-threatening versus not life-threatening at all. Um, if there is acute core pulmonale or acute uh, right-sided heart failure um, related to the, the PE, that will, will add complexity, so documenting that is important. If um, a DVT is provoked, um, we would love to know what is the provoking factor. And in particular, we would like to know if it's secondary to invasive interventions. Um, so whether it's surgery or um, injury, acute illness, long distance travel, these are things that I think of as, as someone interested in hemostasis, which are contributing factors or risk factors for a provoked a VTE. And then specifically in terms of interventions we're doing, if there's a device or there's an implant, um, like a pick line classically in the upper limb, uh, or a CBC in the neck. These things obviously are often quite thrombogenic. They're taking up a lot of the vessel. Obviously the more narrow um, um, device you can use, the better, and it will limit the chance of stasis and therefore DVT. But they will definitely add and they will uh, be counted as a provoking factor. If it's due to some kind of infusion or medication or injection or transfusion related, they also are potential causes of DVT, although less common. Uh, and if there's other specific vascular procedural um, complications that occur, they should be documented as well. In my practice, I think particularly of pick associated DVTs that, that are um, definitely not uncommon. Here's an example of someone that had uh, was admitted for five days with an unprovoked DVT. And if that was an unprovoked DVT and it was specified as a femoral and popliteal vein being involved, that increases the complexity significantly and you can see the big change in funding there. Um, if you have a DVT in the brachial vein uh, up in the upper limb, um, and you were to say that most of these are actually provoked by IV cannulation or a pick line. If you actually specify the fact that it is um, due to a catheter, it actually fits into a different category of coding. And even in the same minor complexity, you're getting another thousand dollars worth of funding towards that because there is complexity um, just, just innate to that particular diagnosis. Here's an example where we have contrasted um, the different coding according to documentation. So if we've got someone that's just cellulitis of the lower le leg, apparently no complications, it's minor complexity, unsurprisingly, with $3,500 worth of funding. If we then were to mention that during the admission, due to the inflammation, the infection, the immobility, they develop a brachial vein DVT, uh, that is going to get major complexity. Now, because they developed that DVT whilst an inpatient, it counts as a, a health-acquired complication or a hack. And so there's a small penalty of the funding um, that is recognising this as a preventable complication. Overall, it's better that we have that in terms of funding, even though in terms of hacks, the statistics won't look fantastic. And you can see that overall, we're still roughly doubling our income. On a similar level, if we were to clarify and say, this was actually a brachial vein DVT due to an IV cannula that we inserted for you know, IV flucloxacillin for the cellulitis uh, that will likewise code appropriately into major complexity and will likewise have a hack associated with it. We're going to talk about hacks in another talk later on. So I'd like to summarise some of the things we've covered today. I'd like to encourage you to avoid using terms like pancytopenia or bicytopenia um, unless you're actually qualifying what is causing them. Ideally, we're going to separate them into anemia, um, thrombocytopenia and uh, leukopenia or neutropenia, if that's specifically what you're dealing with. Um, there are a lot of causes of anemia, and there might be more than one. Please document them. Please document a plan associated with the anemia, even if that's just a repeat blood test, or maybe it's a transfusion or an iron infusion. If there's a coagulopathy or a low platelet count, please document that specifically in the likely cause that's associated. Um, be aware that white cell abnormalities don't code very well at all, but the things that do is immunocompromised status or immunosuppression, uh, and please write why they are immunocompromised.
And lastly, in terms of documenting um, DBTs, please do write whether they're provoked or unprovoked. And when they are provoked, please um, specify what is the causative factor and if, how many veins are involved because the number of veins will increase complexity accordingly. Thanks for listening.